sound and video looks like it's working all right. So low. Is it any better now? Yeah, I know it's not the brightest room in here. Um, so set mic to high. Is that? Justin TV setting. Um, my mic is actually built into my camera, so that means me getting closer to the camera. Still too quiet, or can everybody hear me all right? All right, great. Well, it is 6:01, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Brian. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, bitcoins today. Uh, kind of hard to follow up. Uh, Pete and Adema, they put on a pretty good talk, and uh, so there's a lot of people in the room. So I hope. Uh, give you guys some interesting information. Um, hope you've all had a good Agora I.O. conference so far. Um, been some good talks. I wish I could have caught more, but I'll have to watch them later on video. Okay, um, I'll try to talk a little bit louder. Um, uh, Lydia says she can't hear me. Um, Alright, uh, well, I'll get started with talking about Bitcoins. Uh, is it is it better if I talk louder? Can you guys hear me all right? I don't. Uh, my mic volume's all the way up on my computer. Let's. Um, I'll just get in real close so you guys get to see my head really big, and hopefully you can hear me. All right. Um, well, I'll get started talking about bitcoins. Uh, first of all, I don't know if many of you have heard about bitcoins. Uh, they're, uh, depending on who you ask, it could be some people consider them just pretend internet money, and others would say a revolutionary agorist currency. Uh, they were created a couple years ago. Uh, the by a Japanese programmer uh, named Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, uh, uh, that's probably a pseudonym, but uh, he goes by Satoshi Nakamoto, and he uh, wrote the first idea for Bitcoins, and it was implemented. Uh, this, the whole currency started a couple years ago, uh, and it's been going around, kind of catching on in popularity in the last, uh, I'd say, year or so. Um, they're basically, it's a digital peer-to-peer -peer internet cryptocurrency, uh, which I'll break that down a little bit. So digital means that the money is stored in computer files. It's not not a commodity or not pieces of paper. Peer-to-peer um, -peer means that it's like uh, like BitTorrents, uh, bit where it's, there's no central person, central server that you're downloading from. It's a, it's a network of all the users connected and, and building the currency. It's not uh, backed by any authority. Uh, it's an internet based, so it's, it's across the network that keeps track of it. And it's a cryptocurrency, which means it's based on cryptography technologies. 
Um, yeah, which makes uh, them very secure and potentially untraceable. Um, so I'll talk about the characteristics of money a little bit. Uh, feel free to like ask questions anytime. I'll try to monitor the chat window and uh, and answer them. Um, so the characteristics of money, uh, there's depends on who you ask. There's a number of characteristics that make good money. Um, Aristotle had a, had the characteristics that money should be durable, portable, divisible, convenient, and have intrinsic value. And Rothbard had some of the same characteristics, but uh, his list uh, included uh, uh, included money that is in heavy demand, uh, highly divisible, portable, durable, and have a uh, high per unit weight. Um, so bitcoins are, they definitely are durable. They're, uh, you could say they're a lot more durable than actual commodities. Since they're stored on computer files, they can be backed up and duplicated and stored all over the place. They, there's never a need for them to be lost, even on you know, an atomic explosion wipes out your computer or stuff. If it's backed up, you, you don't lose them. Uh, Lauren, I'll get into that in a, in a minute. Whether the transaction, she's asking uh, whether the transactions are anonymous or known by all the peers, and it's kind of both. But I'll, I'll try to explain that a little bit um, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, uh, another characteristic of money that uh, Rothbard and Aristotle mentioned was portability, and uh, Bitcoin bitcoins can be extremely portable, much more than a commodity, because you can put them on a, as many as you want on a little thumb drive, or and you can send them. You know, around the world, just in with with uh, no actual tangible things moving. You know, just across the internet, which also means they're very convenient uh, for some applications. Anyway, uh, there's uh, they, they're not quite a, they're not convenient for point of sale purchases yet. They're getting more so. Um, another characteristic of money is that they're highly divisible, which bitcoins uh, definitely are. Uh, they're they're computer bits so they can be broken and the way the, the way the script is written they can be broken down to I believe eight decimal points right now and potentially more if uh, the need ever arises so they're very divisible and they're all exactly the same so they have a lot of good characteristics of money um, and I'll go into a couple uh, other uh, advantages that they have especially for people who kind of have more of an agorist liberty mindset and that they're state free which is uh, I think just in itself is a is a great thing that the the government doesn't have control over the money system, and uh, yeah, Joseph, I'll definitely get into that. That's the that's the one thing that bitcoins debatably don't have. They they may not have intrinsic value, uh, and I'll I'll talk about that because I oh I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but the bitcoins are I'll go into a couple more advantages first. So they are state free, they are bank free. Um, which I think is good because right now there's a few major corporations that have a very tight control over the money supply and transactions, uh, especially digital transactions. If you think of Visa and the major banks and PayPal and that kind of stuff, and bitcoins are anonymous or pseudonymous, depending on I mean technically. So they're the way they work is that all the transactions are posted publicly so people can trace it. But the identities of who who's making the transactions is 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 not posted. It's they're, they're one party gives bitcoins to another is is visible, but you don't know who those parties are. Uh, and bitcoins are free to transact or virtually free. Um, uh, there's some it, it can be convenient to add a small transaction fee, but it's it's virtually nothing, especially compared to the fees that Visa and PayPal charge on. Um, also, uh, so, uh, somebody asked about the intrinsic value, which is the one characteristic that Bitcoins may not have. And that's where they've gotten a lot of uh, criticism, especially from the Liberty community, is that they there is no tran tran intrinsic value. Um, or, um, so, you know, this kind of ties into Mises', Mises uh, regression theorem, uh, which talks about how money came to get its value. And you know, if we have our paper money today, the only way it has value is because 
people looked at the value it had yesterday, and that kind of goes back to when it was based on a commodity, and then the commodity only had value for exchange because it had value for use. So that's kind of Mises, Mises' regression theorem, is that going back, you have to trace it to some initial intrinsic value. And uh, this lack of backing or intrinsic value to the currency has, uh, has been an issue with a lot of other currencies. I mean, there's obviously, I think, most people understand the problems with uh, the dollar and uh, the euro and kind of state-run fiat currencies. And barter currencies that have been created have also had kind of this problem is that like thing, things that are based on work hours are just arbitrary uh, value. They're, they're not interchangeable. There's no set unit of value. And it makes it pretty hard to, uh, to figure out what they're worth and if they're worth anything. Let's see, I'm looking at the chat window here for a second. Um, Adam says that they, uh, they might not have started with intrinsic value, but uh, the fact that they're easily transmittable and are redeemable in so many local currencies is a value into and of itself. And I think that's, that's right. Um, uh, that people, I think the initial value came a lot from speculation that they, w because of their so many positive qualities that they, uh, that they would be successful or could be successful as a currency. So people bought them initially as a speculation and that gave them their initial value. And then if you use Mises regression theorem, you can go back to that as kind of the starting point. And whether that's a, a good way to start value or not is kind of debatable, but it, it was a start of value. Uh, yeah, and John mentions that that says that says that Gary North argued that even silver and gold lack intrinsic value, and that value is ultimately imputed. And uh, I mean, it, it's kind of a talking about semantics. Where I, I I definitely think you can you can definitely say that most of the value of silver or gold comes from people's wanting to hold them as as an investment or a money and not as their uh, their use in you know, jewelry or industry or something like that. But you, the, I think some people would make the argument that they needed to have that initial industrial use to become a uh, money. Um, and this lack of backing has hurt a lot of other uh, currencies. Uh, I was talking about work hours and stuff and how they, you know, even if they're redeemable for like hours of work, that that's, that's different for each person, so it's not uniform and it's really hard to to base um, transactions on a currency that's either not not uniformly redeemable or uh, not redeemable at all. Um, and gold, uh, even gold standard um, alternative currencies have been introduced to try to overcome this. Uh, gold money and Liberty Reserve and e-gold and Liberty Dollar are a few. And um, some of them, not, uh, some of them have run into some uh, some pretty big problems that that come with uh, being a centralized money source and. Some people will say that bitcoins are backed by electricity, which isn't really the case. Uh, they make that argument because people creating bitcoins, you have to use a lot of electricity to run their computers, but uh, I don't think that's really what backing of a currency uh, means, is that it, what you have to put into it is more what you can redeem it for, what can you can use it for. And I think if you wanted to try to say that bitcoins were backed by something, you could say it's backed by the security of the network, which is kind of uh, wishy-washy, I guess, in terms of saying that it's back, but uh, the creation of the Bitcoins does come from people making the network more secure, and the use of the Bitcoin uh, on the secure network kind of work into that. So, uh, I, wanna, I think the, the thing that we have to understand, though, about intrinsic value of money is that the intrinsic value is to solve a problem of trust, of trust in the money. So if the if a, a, a non-commodity money is created by somebody, having it back to a commodity or back by a commodity, or especially if it's redeemable, um, means you don't have to trust the issuer to, to not issue too much. You know, the, when the dollar was actually redeemable for gold or when it was actual metal that you could hold, then you don't have to worry that the, the government issuing it would issue too much because there's a limit on how much they can produced just because of the nature of what it's made out of. And that's, I think that's the, that's kind of the, 
the problem that ha that uh, using a metal or something overcomes the the problem of trust in the issuer, and that's really the what I think is the the great advancement with Bitcoin is that the algorithm algorithm is written written in a way that you don't need to trust anybody. It's it's all open source and it's published, so anybody who understands the you know the programming language can look at it and see that that uh, there's only going to be so many created and there's no central authority that can create more and it puts a natural limit on bitcoins. Um, the way the algorithm is written is that there will be a maximum of 21 million bitcoins ever. Uh, right now there's about a quarter of that. I think there's about 6 million bitcoins in existence. And the way the, the, way the uh, algorithm is written is uh, most of them come into existence earlier on and this kind of promotes uh, early adopters, which I think is essential for trying to trying to launch a new currency it's to to incentivize people to adopt it early, so they they get some advantage. And that's kind of been criticized that you know, the people who hopped on the Bitcoin train early uh, potentially have made a lot of money. And I think I think that's I mean it's easy to be jealous of people who saw it first and and hopped on, but uh, I think that's really a an advantage to the Bitcoin money because that incentive for people to jump on early has made it get to the w as much success as it's had, which is quite a bit as far as alternative currencies have gone. And if you look at the total number of Bitcoins ever, 21 million, if you compare that to the US dollar, uh, right now, if you look at the monetary base, there's 1.6 trillion US dollars, or if you look at M2, there's 9.5 trillion. So if you try to divide that out, that's uh, a ratio of uh, when Bitcoins are actually maxed out, when there's 21 million, uh, there'll be one Bitcoin for every $76,000 if you look at the monetary base, or $123,000 if you look at M2. So if Bitcoins ever were to replace the dollar or something, they would have to grow in value significantly. And that's, I mean, I'm not suggesting that they're going to be worth that much, but I'm just just to give you an idea of how much room they have to grow in, in value and usefulness. Uh, let me check the chat window, see if anybody has any questions. So people are talking about uh, the backing of money, which I think is, I mean, that that is the big debate over Bitcoins in the kind of the libertarian community is how important that is. Um, they have money because people subjectively value them. Uh, Joseph says this, and uh, yeah, I agree that that's that's where all value comes from is subjective value, and whether that's what you would call a use value or an exchange value. Either way, it's a it's a value that that individually subjective put on 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 a currency and. Uh, Bitcoins have that right now. They are—I mean, you can already exchange them for dollars. Uh, Joseph asks, "Can Bitcoins be useful some way for transporting gold? Um, for transporting?" Physical gold, uh, they're, they're a way to transport value. So if you wanted to give gold to somebody somewhere else instead of shipping the gold, you could, I don't know, sell it for, sell, trade your gold for bitcoins and send the bitcoins and somebody could redeem the bitcoins for gold wherever they are. I mean, they could be used that way because they, it's one of the big benefits they do have over gold is that they're a lot easier to transport long distances. And uh, so Bitcoins uh, don't have a backing, like I was saying, but I, I want to just kind of mention that that not having a backing allows them to uh, have a lot of these other desirable characteristics. Um, because they're not a commodity, they're not a chunk of silver or gold, they're a lot more convenient to either carry with you or because they're portable and they're easy to ship and send anywhere in the world. Um, they're like I said, they're potentially a lot more durable because you can back them up. You never have to worry about them 
getting destroyed. And I know on a molecular level, gold pretty much is never destroyed, but it can be kind of your coin can be you know, melted in a fire, so it's, you lose it basically. And bitcoins can be lost, but if you take the proper precautions, uh, you don't really have to worry about that. Uh, and bitcoins also have the advantage of anonymity that, in some cases, uh, you know, uh, com commodity or commodity back money doesn't have because you can send them to somebody without actually being in the same location as them or in the same spot. And the big advantage Bitcoins have over a, a commodity back money is that they're decentralized. And to have a commodity back money, all that commodity has to be stored somewhere by some central authority, basically. And that's that's the problem that Liberty Dollar ran into because they had their, they issued their uh, gold and silver certificates, which was a commodity backed you know money, basically. But because there was all centrally stored, it made it a nice, easy target for the feds to raid, and then there goes your backing. So that's the advantage of uh, not trying to back it with uh, gold or give it value because of that, but, but limited by the nature of the network, is that you don't have to trust in the, the honesty of the person issuing it or the security of the person issuing it um, to keep the commodity safe, is that it's, it's secured by the network and by the open source nature and by the hundreds and thousands of people running the Bitcoin software on their computer. Um, I'd like to get into the technicals in a little bit, but I, uh, I want to. The one thing I th want to say about Bitcoin is that the important for them to g the important factor for them to gain success right now, which I think is going to be the biggest hurdle if they ever do catch on, uh, is just finding a niche market to get started in. And you know, I, I think you know, replacing the dollar or something like that is kind of a a pipe dream. It would be great if it happened, but I think the only way for that even to be a possibility is if they catch on in some niche market first. And even if they just are sustained in a niche market, I think there would be a great tool just in that factor. And they're starting to a little bit, but uh, you know, I'll mention a few of the niche markets where Bitcoins really have an advantage over dollars or other kind of currencies. Um, I think there's first the niche market of kind of uh, liberty-minded people who want to use it because of the ideology behind it, which I think is great, and that's a uh, big motivation for me to kind of get involved in Bitcoin in the first place. Um, another niche market is kind of the geeky people, because just the way it's written with the cryptography and stuff, which I'll, I'll try to explain in a little bit, because it's kind of complicated. Um, but geeks really like, you know, kind of get into that stuff, and it's, so it's fun to see it take off with people who like that kind of encryption stuff. Um, they, and they definitely have advantages in uh, kind of illicit trade. Um, think of drugs or online poker now, or if you want to do donations either in just on a small scale where you need, you know, makes a good way to do kind of a chip-in thing where you don't have to worry about credit card fees and that kind of stuff, and you can just send donations in any denomination and keep it anonymous if you want, especially if it's to a to a, an entity that that uh, might not be very popular with the, the government. You know, something like WikiLeaks, where the government tries to cut off funding for them. But Bitcoins, it, the benefit about Bitcoins is that they can't you can't shut off transactions to a source. If people want to send send them, they can send them. Uh, let's see. Let's, I want to talk about a few of the services that you can do right now with uh, Bitcoins. So, um, you know, there's. They definitely don't aren't. I wouldn't say they're to the critical kind of critical mass, so they could kind of take off. But there's definitely a growing number of sources uh, services that are provided, and I'll give links to some of these at, at the end of my talk. But uh, Spend Bitcoins is a nice one. Uh, I've used them before. Uh, they allow you to just buy things on Amazon with Bitcoins, and it's it would be nice if Amazon itself took Bitcoins. But uh, Spend Bitcoins, you have to kind of jump through a couple of hoops, but it's not it's not too difficult. And the nice thing is that they uh, they let you make your purchase in bitcoins, and they don't charge any premium. Uh, they they use the Amazon uh, uh, affiliates program, I think it's called. So if you enter through their portal, they just get a little kickback from whatever you purchase, but it doesn't add anything to your purchase price. And so they give you a flat exchange rate of whatever the current market value is, which today I think is like five dollars and forty cents. Um, so they, yeah, they give you a flat exchange rate, which is really nice. You don't have to worry about paying extra fees to try to transfer currencies, which is is one of the inconveniences right now when bitcoins aren't 
aren't as widespread as they could be. Uh, so I've used them before and with good results. You just tell them the exact total of your shopping cart and they convert it to bitcoins. You pay them and they give you a, a like a coupon code or a gift certificate code basically that you type in and it covers your purchase exactly. Uh, so it's really convenient to work with them. Uh, you know, it adds one or two steps to your Amazon purchase, but it's nice because you can do it with Bitcoins. Uh, there's a number of transaction services where we're just so you can trade Bitcoins for dollars or other currencies. Uh, Mt. Gox is the biggest one um, by far. They're probably at least five, if not ten times bigger than any of the other, the other uh, currency exchanges. Uh, despite having some security issues in the past few months, which uh, uh, led to people's people's information being leaked and uh, people hacking into the system, which caused the you know the price of bitcoins to fluctuate all over because they were messing with the system. But despite that, uh, they still remain the biggest bitcoin exchange, and uh, it's kind of funny because it was just it, you know it's called MTGOX, which uh, most people pronounce pronounce it Mount Gox, but it originally was an acronym for Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. So, I mean, it was just a guy running an exchange for magic cards, and he kind of hopped on the Bitcoin bandwagon and used the software he already had, basically, to open up an exchange for Bitcoins. And uh, Because he, he didn't have all the... He didn't really have the security set up to you know, handle a million dollars a day or whatever of transactions that's going through him. Uh, kind of led to some security problems, but I, it seems like he's fixed most of the problems. So I... I Seems like a still seems like probably your best place for exchanging bitcoins. Although there are a couple other exchanges that are pretty good right now. Uh, Trade Hill is one of them, um, and Exchange of Bitcoins is another one. Uh, Exchange of Bitcoins is really nice because it's it looks like it's very easy to get bitcoin uh, buy bitcoins with them. Uh, where some of the other ones you need to you know um, it's hard to get U.S. dollars into their exchange so you can buy bitcoins in the first place. It's, yeah, a lot of times you have to jump through different different hoops or do a, do a bank wire, which is often expensive or that kind of thing. But Exchange Bitcoins actually uh, lets you uh, deposit cash or check at uh, pretty much any, I don't know about any, but a number of big banks, Wells Fargo and a couple other big banks. You can just go and deposit cash or check and it goes right into your, your U.S. dollar account there and you can buy Bitcoins at whatever the market rate is. Um, and so uh, these, these exchanges, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of people just trading and like kind of day trading on them, trying to make money off the fluctuations in bitcoins, which has been plenty of over the past few months. Um, I think back in April or May, uh, bitcoins were at about one dollar U.S. and they rose to about thirty-five dollars. And then there's a lot of the, the hacking scandals, like the the couple I mentioned with Mt. Gox, and then a couple other places that got hacked. And it wasn't the Bitcoin network itself, but a lot of these secondary services that seem like a lot of them are kind of just being run by kids in their basement without the proper security features. So a lot of the hacking, I think, kind of uh, uh, broke people's confidence in Bitcoin. Some people, so which caused the price to come down from $35 to what I said it was today, I think $540, $530, something like that. So, uh, but I, so it's, the Bitcoins are not stable by any means. I wouldn't recommend them as an investment unless you have some money to throw away, but I want to encourage them as a means of exchange because even if you want to invest with them, the only way your investment's going to even the only way holding them is going to turn out to be a good investment is if they catch on as an exchange. So even if you want to buy some to hold, buy some to spend as well. Um, so I think that's really the value in Bitcoin is as as a currency and not as a investment or speculation. Uh, a couple other services are available. Um, Bit Option. Uh, dot com. They're they're down right now, but he's I guess he's working on redoing the site. But it's a it's an options exchange. So for people who like to play the market, you can actually buy options and uh, like puts and stuff on your uh, the Bitcoin price. So you can bet on it going up or down at different prices. And which hopefully, if there's some good speculators in there, it will actually uh, people who know what they're doing it could actually level out the price of Bitcoin a bit because um, people have been. You know, a good speculator will buy on the high, which will bring the highs down, and sell on the lows, which will bring the lows up, so you get more of a, a steady price, which would be great for Bitcoins. A um, couple other services, uh, Silk Road, of course, I can't can't uh, forget to mention them, which is kind of the, the infamous eBay of drugs. 
and you have to use uh, the Tor, which is another uh, kind of encryption tool. So you can visit the site completely anonymous, and you exchange with people completely anonymously, and use Bitcoin. So it's as anonymous as it can be to buy illegal drugs. Of course, if you're buying them, you do need to provide an address to ship to. But other than that, um, I'm not a big advocate of drug use, but if you're going to use drugs, this is a great way to kind of bypass the state's uh, crackdown on them, uh, especially if you don't have somebody locally to get them from. Um, I just checked a few days ago, and there's there's a few hundred uh, uh, sales up, or a few hundred uh, posts up there with under the marijuana category. So there's there's a bit of selection there if you're interested. Um, and I want to show you one other uh, new thing that I've just kind of been messing around with. Uh, it's the it's a a Bitcoin on your on your mobile phone. So let me see if I can show you this. This is a new, uh, it's great for a uh, point of sale kind of transactions. Let me, just give me a second here to pull it up and I'll show you how it works. And I think this is the kind of thing that's going to make Bitcoin's, uh, Bitcoin's, uh, work as a, as a point of sale transaction. So you can actually go in and buy a latte or buy a, buy a book at the bookstore. Uh, I think Bitcoin already has a big advantage for long distance online type purchases, but it would be great if you could see an easy implementation for uh, for spending them uh, at a point of sale. And they, they already are a few places you take them. I know that in Manhattan there's at least one restaurant, so it seems like every story that, that uh, you see done on Bitcoin, especially if it's the, the reporters in New York, they'll always go visit this, uh, this restaurant to see how you can actually buy things with Bitcoins. So there's a couple different apps. I'm using Android. Uh, it's kind of bright. I guess you can't see it. But you can uh, hit a button and request a number of Bitcoins. And it will... Uh, uh, it's still kind of bright. But it generates a QR code. And then with the other, the other one, you can just click uh, Send Money and scan the QR code. I'm sorry, I can't. I'm trying to show you and look at it at the same time, but it's pretty easy. You just scan the barcode, and it uh, and it will bring up the address. There, okay. So it brings up. Uh, you can't see. I right, just take my word for it. It brings up the the Bitcoin address and the amount, so it's really convenient if you're if you're trying to sell stuff. You just type in type in the amount you want to receive, and it already has your addresses in there. And it brings up a QR code, and just have the person paying scan the QR code. Um, of course, some of the limitations to the Bitcoin network are that uh, that uh, the the, we the weakness is that a you know, transaction can potentially be undone before it actually gets incorporated into the blockchain. I know this is kind of technical stuff. I'll, I'm, if I have time at the end, I'm going to go into the technicals a little bit, and I think I will. But uh, uh, it takes a it takes a little while for your transaction to be confirmed because it basically has to go to the whole network, and everybody has to say, "Yeah, this is a valid transaction. This is good." and we're recording it in the ledger. Um, so if you want to do an instant point of sale, there's a little bit of um, just assuming that the person is being honest, but that's also kind of the case with credit cards. It's probably worse with credit cards because credit cards and PayPal as well, they can be uh, charged back up to two or three months after the after the fact. So especially if if, if it vendor waits for the transaction to go through, it's much safer for the vendor than other forms of transactions, but uh, uh, but a point of sale might be a little riskier, so it's, uh, it's kind of up to how much the vendors want to take it. I don't know if there's actually been any cases of people trying to pull a, pull a, a double spend where they would take their money back, but in theory it's possible if, if you don't wait for it to be confirmed by the whole network. But you do get to see it instantly that that the transaction has been sent. So uh, usually, virtually instantly, the the seller will see yes, the the coins are on their way. They just haven't been confirmed yet. Um, so let's see. I want to get into the technicals now. Um, well, I do want to mention um, kind of some of the recent hacks. Um, go into a little bit more. I talked about a couple of them with. Uh, Mount Gox, and another another bad one was, uh, I think it was called My Bitcoin, which was an online wallet, which is really nice in theory, so then you're, 
you don't have to have the Bitcoin software running on your computer or on your phone. Because uh, right now with my wallet, my Bitcoin wallet on my phone, the Bitcoins actually, they live on my phone. And so I think one of the services actually will back it up to your Google account. But if it's not backed up somewhere, if you lose your phone, you the Bitcoins are gone. If you lose your the data. So an online uh, wallet is a nice idea if it's implemented well. But unfortunately, uh, I think it was probably the biggest one out there, my Bitcoin, uh, it was my Bitcoins or my Bitcoin. Uh, it turned out he got hacked. He didn't have good security or he claims he got hacked. I know there's a lot of speculation of whether the, the owner of the site just kind of ran away with everybody's money. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of still a wild west in the whole Bitcoin world right now. Um, okay, so I think I've kind of covered most of it. Uh, I'll go into the technicals a little bit and then I'll try to leave some time at the end for questions because, I don't know, I wasn't really able to keep up with the chat window. So, uh, you, you've been asking questions, just ask them again at the end and I'll I'll try to get into them. So, um, first of all, uh, Bitcoin is based on cryptography or encryption technology, and it's based around the a complicated math formula that's really, really hard, almost impossible to do one direction, but yet really easy to verify the other direction. So, the the way a Bitcoin works is that it lives as a as a chain from the point where it was created, and through all the transactions it's gone to. And so each time you send it, you verify that you are the person who it was sent to. And so you give give your, you basically sign it with a key that is verifiable as you are the recipient. But nobody could, the math to, to ha hack that or forge a key is, is impossible or virtually impossible. So you show that you are the true owner and then you put uh, the public key of the recipient down there so that they are the next owner and nobody knows who that next owner is until they claim it to send to spend it again so it's kind of interesting and that's in this whole log of who owns all the bitcoins or who they've been sent to last is publicly distributed on everybody's computer who's running the, the software so you can just look it up and say does this person's is this per are these bitcoins do they actually belong to this person that they can send them to me and you can see that and so this blockchain with all these transactions goes back to 2009 when the bitcoins were started. Or yeah, they go so you, and it builds on itself, which makes the net every new new node that every new block that comes out, which a block is kind of all the transactions over about 10 minutes get put together in one block and time stamped and verified and added to this chain. Um, so you have the whole blockchain that has each each chain of transactions going all the way back. And it kind of gets it gets locked down by the the computers who are doing the mining of bitcoins, which is a really really neat way to, cr to create a new money to put it print it into existence instead of uh, you know just giving it to all your bankster friends, which is seems like the, the U.S. dollar. That's how they get put into existence. But the bitcoins get uh, rewarded to the people who are anybody who's using their computer to add to the network, to add security to the actual currency to make it more trustworthy and not the uh, not the U.S. banks which tend to be making the U.S. dollar less trustworthy. Uh, so it's a really neat positive incentive that's kind of created with the Bitcoins. So everybody running a node uh, or running a node uh, is processing these encryption problems basically to uh, to uh, to secure the chain and make it make it tougher to crack or tougher to forge, so it's it's very difficult to form a next a new block and one's created every 10 minutes all from all the thousands of computers that are working on it. They the, they scale the difficulty, so that it's very difficult to create this new block. And the way the way the blocks work is it has the, all the transactions that have happened recently, plus the link to the previous block to show that it is building on what where the last block left off. And then they they kind of hash it, which is a, a complex computer process, basically that takes all this information and puts it into a formula that spits out a, sh a relatively short string of numbers. And the the math is very complicated. That from that you can't predict what the string is going to be at the end, but you can verify that it does uh, give that string pr relatively easily. So you have to try uh, various hashes, and you, there's one, you just put in a random number at the end, basically, and your computer keeps trying random numbers 
to get a hash that actually works out to something that matches their test, which is kind of an arbitrary test that's just that's changed to change the difficulty so that no more than than one block is solved every 10 minutes. Um, that was kind of a brief overview, but uh, so these blocks go out and they they're distributed to the whole network, and everybody can verify that all the transactions are legitimate and the block itself is legitimate. And the creator of the block, the, as the first transaction there, will give themselves 50 bitcoins, which is the way the software is written. So that's how the new bitcoins get into existence. And the difficulty of creating these these new blocks, because so many new people with powerful computers have joined the network in the last four or six months, has really skyrocketed. So it used to be you could uh, you could mine with your you know, PC just running running off your processor and uh, and make quite a few bitcoins every day, but but now uh, you need top of the line, very fast graphics cards, and it's you know very expensive computers running, and you rarely ever solve a block. So most most people who try that now are kind of gotten into groups where they'll split the profits and do profit sharing, and it's it's a lot of money to put into mining, and almost at any point it's been true that if you think bitcoins are going to be successful, you can buy them or you can mine and Generally, buying them turns out to be a better a better deal than spending money on a computer to try to mine them. But it's great that so many people have jumped on. I mean, a lot of people think of it, thought of it, I think, as a kind of a get-rich-quick scheme, which are, for the first few people who jumped on, it kind of ended up being. But for most people, it's you spend a lot of money on a computer and you don't really make that money back. But it's great because it's great for the network because that adds a lot of security to the network. All these extra people uh, adding nodes and making it the a lot more difficult to forge. And okay, so you, the keys of all the bitcoins you have are stored locally on your computer in a wallet file. And it's it's really exciting. The new the new uh, client just came out. I think uh, a couple days ago. So your wallet file can now actually be encrypted, which is a huge security uh, feature that should have been implemented probably a lot earlier. But a lot of the software is still kind of in the early stages, so it's it's. There's a lot of room for improvement, and it is being improved on, but it takes a while. Um, so now, your if your computer gets stolen, um, you you don't necessarily lose your bitcoins if you have them backed up somewhere. Uh, whereas before, when it w when your wallet file wasn't encrypted, if people got a hold of your computer or just were able to get in and copy that one file, they could spend all your your money. So the bitcoins have a lot. They they can be very secure, but you have to take the steps. And up until now, it wasn't implemented into the software to do that for you. And there's no central authority that you can complain to and ask for your money back uh, if somebody takes it, like Visa, so, like Visa could if you got your credit card stolen. Um, but now there's encryption, so that's a big step towards uh, towards security. Although, I mean, if you have a key logger, they could steal your password, which is kind of the same for any online banking site, I guess, for that matter. So. So viruses could still steal your money, but they could steal your dollars too. So, um, I think that mostly covers everything I wanted to talk about. Um, I guess the main point of my my talk was that uh, I think bitcoins have a lot of potential to provide um, a state-free and corporation-free medium of exchange, and I think it's important for them, for them to be successful. They need to catch on first in some some niche uh, where they can kind of grow, and I don't think they're gonna take over the whole world in the next year or something, but uh, I think if they can find a niche to kind of survive for a while, then it would be great for them to kind of establish themselves as a medium of exchange, and then uh, if and when the dollar kind of, uh, people, when, if and when people lose faith in the dollar, the Bitcoin, Bitcoins can be there as an established medium of exchange that people can, can start to use more. Um, and I think the other the other big hurdle for bitcoins to overcome is just the infrastructure needs to be uh, built to support it, which is being done more so. Like with that point of sale app that I showed on my my phone, um, stuff like that is really going to make uh, bitcoins a lot more successful. And, it's, and especially if some infrastructure with some some reliability and trustworthiness can be built, because still a lot of these these early uh, early uh, little businesses that are starting up around Bitcoin are not very, have proven not very trustworthy. So some reliable, trustworthy infrastructure can be established uh, and the Bitcoins can catch on in some niche market. I think they have the potential to be really successful. But, and I would 
encourage people uh, who have are from a liberty mindset and don't really like the the idea behind the the dollar and stuff to kind of try out bitcoins and use them use it use spendbitcoins.com to buy some stuff on Amazon or something like that something easy or if you if you want to buy some pot use the Silk Road try them out because I think I think some of this new technology that allows allows the average person to 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 get around the government's ban on on narcotics and around the government's uh, Junky fiat currency is great, and being able to bypass the, that stuff with technology is is great. Um, so yeah, I'll look in the chat window now, see if there's any uh, questions. Okay, let's see. Uh, Joseph just asked, wasn't there one case where an exchange was able to rescue stolen bitcoins? Um, well, the the, the 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 online wallet service, my bitcoins said they were able, they were the ones who said they got hacked and got most of their stuff stolen, but uh, it's, it's kind of debated whether they took off with it. They did rescue some of the bitcoins, so I think they paid back, I don't know, 40% to the people who had their bitcoins stored in the service. And the, the idea of the online wallet is so you don't have to have your bitcoins stored on your computer. You don't have to worry about taking the, the precautions to encrypt your, your, uh, your file with your bitcoins or back them up. And so it's a great idea for that service, but you know, they they did get hacked and they lost a lot of them. They but they, they were able to uh, to rescue some of them. Or if they were the hackers, they decided to give some back to try to avoid scrutiny. Is the, the alternative story, depending on who you believe. Um, well, you were thinking of something else. Um, Mount Gox was the other big hack, I think, and uh, kind of made made headlines in the Bitcoin world when they got hacked because it seemed like they. They kind of undid a lot of. Well, first, somebody. It looked like somebody sold off a ton of bitcoins, which crashed the price. They crashed the price all the way to a penny, basically. And then Mt. Gox froze everything and re rewound the transactions, which a lot of people were pretty upset because it felt like this Mt. Gox wasn't supposed to be policing the transaction. It was supposed to be like a free transaction, but like a free market of exchange. But what turned out actually happened uh, was. That they weren't actually bitcoins that were being sold. Somebody just got into the Mt. Gox ledger and added something like I don't know um, a million bitcoins or something to that weren't actually in Mt. Gox. So the transactions were never really legitimate. So they undid a lot of that and put everybody's money back in their account. Um, I don't know if that's what you're thinking about, Joseph. That was that was probably the other biggest hack. Um, I'm not sure. If, I don't know if that's what you were talking about, or if that was something else. But yeah, uh, the thing about get, if you do get your Bitcoin stolen, the the public record. It, I mean, it's, the transactions are published, so it's potentially possible to follow where your Bitcoins go. I mean, they're all to anonymous addresses, basically. But if you find an address somewhere, if if WikiLeaks publishes their donation address, you can see if all your Bitcoins get donated to WikiLeaks or something like that because you can see what address they're sent to. Uh, let's see another question. Uh, John asks, uh, how vital is the cryptogra cryptographic security? Uh, what if some future developing technology, such as quantum computing, renders the security scheme trivial? Uh, and it's kind of speculative, but uh, right now the, the cryptographic security is very secure. Uh, it's SHA-256, and it's, uh, I don't know if that means, that probably doesn't mean anything to anybody, but uh, it's it's very secure and pretty much impossible to crack. Uh, quantum computing, I'm not too familiar, with, but I have heard that quantum computing potentially could render uh, like pretty much like all modern cryptography kind of obsolete. And you know, if that happens, it's you know, I'm, it could be possible to implement. And it's probably I think it is possible. It would take a lot of work to implement kind of a new cryptographic scheme for bitcoins, and it's if you can get the majority of the network to switch over to kind of some new modality, it's possible to to survive something like that. But I think there's a lot of other issues if, if the super secure cryptographies that we have today are cracked, because that's all digital money uses this. Every time you use Visa or something like that, the security is insured by these type of cryptographies. So as far as any internet monetary transaction, uh, they're kind of all in the same boat when it comes to somebody cracking some of these cryptographies.
Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Let's see, I'll scroll up and see if I've uh, missed some. Oh, I do want to give uh, give uh, some credit to uh, Mike uh, Morsery, I think his name is, uh, who gave a Bitcoin talk yesterday. It was pretty good. I, I, he answered some good questions, and I kind of borrowed a few uh, few of the materials that he uh, presented. Um, oh, let me uh, post some of the the links I uh, I, uh, I mentioned. Uh, let's see. What about my currency supply question, Brian John? Uh, John says. Can you, can you type that question again, John? I, I'm, I don't know if I'm seeing that here. Uh, meanwhile, let me uh, grab these links to share. Okay, so this is uh, on the the kind of official Bitcoin website. It's uh, that kind of lists all the vendors who take bitcoins. Um, okay, uh, John's asking it to me to expand on the dynamics of bitcoin currency supply. Yeah. So the way al the algorithm is written is that the supply of bitcoins will asymptotically approach 21 million, which means it'll it'll grow faster in the first stages, and then as it gets closer to 21 million, it, it kind of plateaus, and total supply never exceeds 21 million. So right now, uh, the people who are mining bitcoins uh, collectively get uh, 50 bitcoins every 10 minutes. And in, I think within the next year, that's going to be cut down to uh, half of that, to 25. And then uh, I think it's every few years, m maybe every four years, that, that g number gets cut down again. So it's, it's based on how many blocks are created that first number of blocks all get awarded 50 bitcoins and then it gets cut down to 25 and down to 12 and a half and it just keeps getting cut in half and half and half until it it's you're not really generating any by running the nodes uh, but the way the system is then uh, programmed is that uh, it's still possible for the nodes to make money and there's still incentives there uh, because the, n the nodes can collect a transaction fee and the nice way that the transaction fees work is that it is really a, a free market for transaction fees and so whatever the node asks for for a transaction fee is what it is what the transaction fee is but if you're sending money you don't have to attach any transaction fee and you just have to wait until one of the nodes who doesn't want a transaction fee will solve a block and incorporate your transaction for it to be secured into the blockchain so it's kind of neat that uh, and in the future the way it's, it's thought to work out is that if you want your transaction to go really quickly you will add a bigger transaction fee and if you're not in a hurry you can just add one bit penny or whatever some trivial amount that that it will get incorporated soon but not necessarily immediately uh, the threshold of 21 million is kind of a weird number I don't it was ar it was pretty arbitrary and I mean look all the numbers 50 every 10 minutes is I mean completely arbitrary I think that the principle of starting off producing more and then kind of plateauing kind of the main feature behind it, but the, the units are kind of irrelevant. Um, uh, this is idea to kind of mimic a natural resource like gold. Is when, so when you, you know, the California gold rush first started, people could just pick chunks of gold up out of the river. So it was really easy to come by, but then it got harder and harder to come by as time went on. So that's kind of, it was kind of mimicked, tried, tr it was done to try to mimic that. And it was also, also done to try to reward the early adopters so that uh, which I think is really essential to actually get people using the currency early on and get the network established with a lot of security early on so it can't be hacked. Um, John asks, uh, this is not in any way a debt-based currency. Uh, no interest claim is placed on newly cre created Bitcoins. Uh, yeah, that's that's correct. It's uh, There's no debt. I mean, 
you could theoretically establish a fractional reserve banking system around bitcoins as the monetary base, but in and of themselves, there's no there's no inherent debt in them when they're created. Um, okay, I'll, I'll throw a couple more links up there. If people that have other questions, they can uh, throw them in. Um, okay, this is exchangebitcoins.com. That's uh, one of the exchanges, and that's the one where it's, it seems like it's pretty easy. I haven't actually used this service, but it seems pretty easy to get your bitcoins into them because you can deposit them at Wells Fargo, or you can buy, composite, deposit U.S. cash or check at Wells Fargo or some of these other banks. Um, let's see. Uh, here is uh, spendbitcoins.com, uh, which allows you to spend your bitcoins at Amazon or some of these other sites that don't officially take bitcoins. Uh, let's see. Let's um, here's uh, WeUseCoins.com. They put together a really nice uh, little flash video kind of thing that explains bitcoins and how to use them, which uh, is really worth checking out. Uh, it's one of the best kind of uh, information pieces on bitcoins that I've seen. Here is uh, Bitcoin or B E T C C O dot I N, and they're they're a uh, Bitcoin poker room, which I think is a Another really neat niche that uh, bitcoins could catch on now that the federal government has kind of cracked down on on poker rooms that are based in U.S. dollars. But the nice thing about bitcoins is that you can't track them and you can't stop them from being used for poker, especially if the poker site is hosted outside the U.S. borders. Uh, let's see. Uh, Joseph asks, is bitcoin popularity growing again after the hacks of the present year? Um... I don't know how you quantify that. I haven't checked like the Google Trends or anything, but it seems like there haven't been quite as many news news stories uh, in the last uh, month or two um, that I've seen. Um, the price the price has kind of declined from then, but it's it's gone down to uh, I think four dollars and something, and then it's up to up to five forty. So if you want to try to judge the pop popularity and the based on the price, you can kind of look at that. So it's um, it looks like it kind of hit the bottom at about four, four and change, and is, uh, is rising up again. Uh, Oliver uh, asks if there is a price history chart, and yeah, there is. Uh, uh, Bitcoincharts.com has them listed. Uh, it lists for all the exchanges, so it's kind of overwhelming when you first go there. But uh, uh, you click on charts at the tops, at the top. And I think it defaults the Mt. Gox exchange to U.S. dollars, which is kind of the most relevant. So uh, if you click on charts, yeah, and then you can set you can set the time period, so you can go back a year or you can go back to all the data. So you can see it really exponentially increased there for a while when a lot of the new uh, a lot of new uh, new news pieces and stuff were coming out um, about bitcoins, and then. Then after the hacks, I think I think the hacks were the major thing that set the price back, um, because a lot of a lot of people who are buying into them speculatively uh, kind of lost some confidence after that, um, which is probably good because the, I don't know if the the price seemed like it was rising a little too fast there, and it's it's hard to kind of price things with a constant currency if the price is a uh, is rising that quickly. So uh, and again, if the price is falling quickly, that's not great either. So if the price can stabilize, I think that's that would be great for actually doing transactions with bitcoins. And it's oh, um, speaking of that, uh, somebody was asking about the popularity. Uh, Joseph asked about the popularity. Another another metric, I guess, of looking at the popularity is the difficulty of mining the bitcoins. That basically covers how how many people or how much computing power is on the network uh, creating bitcoins. And that that's kind of followed the price. It hasn't come down nearly as dramatically since the peak, but it has kind of plateaued and started to, it has declined a little bit, but it's still pretty close to the peak in the number of computers that are that are uh, on the system mining. Joseph asks, uh, would Bitcoins be rendered not useful by Obama's internet kill switch or similar? Um, if, if there's no internet, you can't really use Bitcoins, at least on the n regular network. Um, I'm, I don't think that o Obama or the federal government would be able to completely kill the internet, so I think bitcoins would still survive, especially in other parts of the world, which would keep the keep the bitcoin blockchain alive. 
it would make it a lot diff more difficult to actually send bitcoins. But if you have them on your your in your wallet file, you could just copy that file to a jump drive or something and trade that. But it would be a lot a lot less convenient without actual internet access. I uh, hope that answers your question. Well, I guess we're 6.59, so unless anybody has any last-minute questions, uh, have a good evening, and I hope you guys uh, enjoyed uh, Agora I.O. Um, it was a good time, I think. Um, and look forward to the next one, George. Oh, one last question. Uh, so once I download the software, my computer is effectively my bank, and I'm stuck with the computer. Uh, um, uh, no, not necessarily. You can the the wallet the, it's a, creates a wallet.dat file which can be copied anywhere. You can copy it onto your onto a flash drive and bring it to another computer to use. You can you can uh, I, I don't have the newest version of the client that automatically encrypts my wallet file, so I I use TrueCrypt, which is a really nice service that can encrypt files. So I use TrueCrypt and then save my wallet file to the cloud so I can access it from anywhere if I needed to. Um, yeah. All right. Well, have a good evening, everybody, and uh, use Bitcoins. <laughs>